Hello. You have asked for it. Todd Conklin. Todd Conklin. Todd Conklin. Todd Conklin. Todd Conklin. The interview with Todd Conklin from the Pre-Accident Investigation Podcast. On July 24th, be one of the first to hear the Todd Conklin interview here on Safety FM. SafetyFM.com with Jay Allen. Changing safety cultures one broadcast and one podcast at a time. Welcome to Safety FM, where we talk about safety that's truly inspired by you. Hello and welcome to Safety FM. This is Jay Allen. This episode of the broadcast and the podcast is brought to you by Safety Focus Moment. They are consultants wanting to help you obtain the safety culture that you've been looking for. For more information, go to safetyfocusmoment.com. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different than what we're accustomed to. Today, we're going to talk about human trafficking, a subject that's normally not covered inside of most safety podcasts or safety meetings. But this is some information that I think that we need to listen to, not just as a person, not just as family members, not just as employees or team members, but this is something that we need to understand how it's having effect on us and affecting the world that we live in. So today I have an interview with with Susan Peters, Executive Director for Onbound. SafetyFM.com Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to the show. I appreciate you actually taking the time today to actually come on to Safety FM. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, Ms. Susan Peters, if you don't mind, if you could actually tell our audience exactly about your organization, Upbound. Okay. Um, well, my name is Susan Peters and I'm the National Director of Unbound. And we are headquartered in Waco, Texas, but we have chapters around the nation and also internationally. And we are an organization that fights human trafficking. So a lot of people aren't aware that there are 40 million modern day slaves in the world today. And so most of that is through uh, labor trafficking or through sex trafficking. So we majorly focus on um, sex trafficking and mostly domestic sex trafficking. And that means American boys and girls and young women that are trafficked right here in the U.S. in our cities. And do you see this being a common problem in the United States itself? I know that sometimes when we have these conversations or even think about it, we normally think about foreign countries where they would have the problem. So it's common here in the States. Yes. In fact, when we started Unbound in 2012, I thought we would do do more international human trafficking because it is such a global issue. Um, But when we started doing research about how much domestic minor sex trafficking and sex trafficking is happening right in our communities and we knew that we had to start here. And so, for example, right here in Waco, Texas, which is, you know, kind of a middle range city, you know, we had over 50 victims of human trafficking that we helped last year. And this year we've already surpassed 50. And so it's a huge issue. Unfortunately, it's a supply and demand business and there's a huge demand for bought sex and the seemingly in supply of young people that are vulnerable in our communities. And so sex trafficking has become a huge issue within the United States. And what do you feel are the lures that people are actually when they get into sex trafficking? How do you feel that they're lured into this? Well, most people think, you know, they might have seen the movie Taken. And so they think that these victims are kidnapped and forced into that. And although that does happen, that is very, very, very rare. What normally happens is a trafficker or a pimp can be a single person, you know, just have one girl work for them, or they can have, you know, it could be a drug dealer on the street that's turned to human trafficking and has three or four or five girls, or it can be a sophisticated cartel like gangs, drug cartels, business people, because this is a very, very lucrative business. I mean, one 
girl could make a trafficker a hundred thousand dollars a year. So it's a very lucrative business, very low startup cost, and what they do is target young people. Usually, the average age a young person is pulled into sex trafficking in the U.S. is 15, and so that's a 14 or 15 year old that you know a lot of times it can happen to anyone. We've had college graduates. We've had. Um, last summer, we had two girls that both their parents were CEOs of companies. Um, so it can happen to anyone, any nationality, ethnicity, socioeconomic background. But the majority of the victims are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, single family homes where there's not the protection in the home. Um, they have a lot of free time. And they have vulnerabilities of wanting to feel loved or provided for, and so a trafficker will target those vulnerabilities in some a young person. Get in a relationship with them, either posing as a boyfriend or as an older protector, and then slowly introduce drugs, sexualized behavior, and then start selling them. And that's how they become trafficked. And so that's that's normally what we see is someone who is coerced into this life. And I have to say, you really said a lot. And so I want to go back and try to unpack a little bit of it. Now, in doing some of the research in regards to when we were going to have the conversation with you, we did notice that it said that the annual estimate is roughly about $150 billion in this particular industry, which is just amazing just, hear, just hearing that number out loud. And when you start taking, taking a look and you're helping out people, what do you find to be the common, I guess, the, I guess the, the common audience or the common people that are actually going out there and looking for these, I guess, the people that are being victimized by this? So, so you're asking about what is the commonality of a trafficker? What does a trafficker profile look like? Correct. So, so how do I, so I know that you referenced that, you know, that they, that they pretend to be an older person or they try to attempt to be a protector, but who are the people that are, so now all of a sudden we have the victim that's being trafficked. And so how does it go about from the person that's actually coming in, I guess, asking for these sex favors or paying for these sex favors? Yeah. I mean, the victims that we help and um, their stories, you know, are very, but there's a lot of similarities. Um, Traffickers will very often target young people on social media. And so there are so many apps and Facebook messaging, Kick. Um, and so they will usually, you know, we had a victim that was 16. They, you know, it got posted on her Facebook pages. She was 16. And so the trafficker sent her a private message, happy birthday, and then built a relationship around that, posed as a 20 year old guy who, you know, over two months just got this girl to fall in love with him and then when he showed up at her house he was a 40 year old um, and so and he was like well I didn't want to tell you how old I was because you're so mature for your age I just really wanted you to be my girlfriend and that's how he lured away and ended up pimping her out um, and so it's you know a lot of times it's targeting them through relationship building through social media that very often happens and a lot of times that young person will be you know, they they do risky behavior. They'll go meet them. They'll sneak out at night. You know, they'll they'll you know maybe send sexting. They'll send an inappropriate picture. But then that trafficker uses that information to blackmail them or you know pull them in deeper and deeper into this trouble that they had no idea they were going to get into. Now, is there something that we can actually recognize as a pattern that somebody who's being victimized as such? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the social media is, is really challenging because it changes all the time. But I think, you know, in schools, we're trying to educate more and more. We're doing assemblies, things like that, to really educate um, young people, parents, teachers, on the vulnerabilities of the social media and having those checks in place and knowing who they're connecting with. Um, you know, a lot of times when you see a student all of a sudden changing their circle of friends from the kids they grew up with and all of a sudden they have friends that are outside of the school, they are starting to quit their, um, their extracurricular activities, their grades start plummeting, they start missing school. I mean, there's some signs that this kid is heading for trouble that can be investigated and try to catch them, hopefully when they're being groomed instead of full force being um, trafficked. So there's definitely some signs to look for in young people that are vulnerable for being trafficked. 
So if we recognize one of those signs, what is the best thing that we can do to assess? Well, we do a lot of training um, because all different disciplines um, can play a part in recognizing and helping out a potential victim. So, so for example, um, in schools, you know, administrators, nurses, uh, the social services uh, people. There's a lot of times a homeless liaison in, in public schools now. So if they're educated on the signs of trafficking and human trafficking, then they can really intervene in a student's life. Because a student, they're not going to recognize themselves as a trafficking victim. They may know, I got in a bad relationship with this older guy. He's forcing me to do things I'm not really comfortable with. But this is what you do in a relationship or we're trying to save money for a b or c whatever lie he gave her so it's going to be really blurry for that victim and so if the you know teacher counselor nurse um, social worker understands trafficking then when that student may give them just a tiny bit of that picture they can ask more questions to try to unwrap what's really going on with that student many times a young person um, will talk about maybe one rape situation, but really what's gone on is maybe they have been sold for months, but they can't tell that horrible of a story, but they can just tell a tiny bit. But when you're educated and you try to make it a safe place, say, what else is going on? What? Tell me about what's been hard. You know, who, are you being forced to do something you're not comfortable with? You know, where did you get that tattoo or who's providing housing for you or that expensive purse or your nails getting done, you know, just start probing and asking those questions to find out, you know, who are you in a relationship with and is this a healthy relationship to be in? When there's a big age differentiation between a young person and an older boyfriend or caregiver kind of thing, um, those are kind of red flags to start investigating. So those are some of the things school officials can do. Um, the ER and medical facilities being educated on human trafficking is a huge area um, that that we're really trying to focus on um, across the nation because 90% of human trafficking victims go through the medical clinics or ERs and they are not getting recognized. Um, they're presenting with different issues and oftentimes STDs and they're just being treated and turned away instead of recognizing for those signs, isolating them from the person who brought them in and trying to give them a safe place to find out what's going on with them. And so that's another place. And other social service providers, um, foster care systems, juvenile detention centers, there's a, there's a lot of people in the community that, that can be educated to be the eyes and ears for vulnerable people. So if our, you know, if our audience wanted to actually get involved with your organization, what could they do? We, um, they can go on our website, which is unboundnow.org. Um, we have a volunteer page to sign up. We have a giving page to sign up because we're completely supported by financial gifts, which is amazing, the support we've been given. Um, but there's, you know, educating yourself on it, number one. There's many good books, and we have recommendations on our website. But learning more about human trafficking so that they're educated um, supporting an organization like ours um, so that you can volunteer. And we use all kinds of different gift sets um, because we have IT people, law enforcement, attorneys, um, teachers, trainers, um, other advocacy people that can help with victims because we'll, you know, go meet them, take them to counseling sessions. I mean, there's lots of ways that um, really anyone can be involved with an organization like ours to help make a real difference and stop this. Okay. And could you give us uh, an example of a, of a success story that you had or the one that sticks out in your head in particular of something that occurred and how your organization was able to help? Oh, sure. We've, we have, you know, quite a few. Um, we had one, um, victim here that was 15. She had been in and out of foster care systems. And she had run away and a older man in his 50s literally drugged her and put her in a back room and sold her repeatedly out of his home. And local, I mean, luckily, um, our law enforcement was able to get her, recover her. Um, our organization jumped in to provide services for her, safe place for her. Our DA's office worked extremely hard to um, 
prosecute her trafficker. Our Crimes Against Children unit were incredibly supportive of her. She was in the juvenile detention center for a while, so the counselors there really supported her. So it was really the community rallied around this young person, and her trafficker got 12 consecutive life sentences for trafficking her. And she is, you know, on a road to recovery and is, is you know, doing well. And so that's good. We have one who actually um, was charged as a trafficker because a lot of times what happens is when you have someone who has been trafficked and once they've been in for a couple of years, they become the bottom is what they call them. They're, they're, they're the right hand person, the leader of the other girls. And so they um, actually recruited two young people that ran away from a uh, youth home and recruited them to be trafficked and they were arrested. So both the male older trafficker, original trafficker, and then the 21 year old were charged with being a trafficker. But I knew as soon as I saw it in the paper, this girl's only 21. She's a trafficking victim who gets used as the recruiter. And that's definitely what happened. And I went and visited her in jail and we started working with the DA's office. She was placed in a safe house for a one year program. And we, as well as other organizations, because it takes more than one, um, really supported her. And now it's been four years and she works full time uh, as a survivor advocate for Unbound Fort Worth. And she oh, wow. speaks, she's finishing her book, she's finishing her degree in social work, and she's really, really doing amazing. That That is an amazing story. I mean, that is surprising that she was able to make such a great turnaround. Now, is there any legislation in place for this? I mean, is there something that we could call, you know, call our senators or something along those lines or really kind of make a push or an emphasis on this? Yeah, there's a lot of um, a lot of laws that are on the books and being pressed through. I mean, there's it's it's constantly involving the needs um, for these victims and compensation and justice. Um, so, um, I mean, right now, I can't think of something that we're right now pushing. We the Trafficking Victim Protection Act is um, one of the best laws that identify what a trafficking victim is, um, and it recognizes in the law that a victim is someone who has been forced or had fraud or coercion. And that's brilliant because we understand forced or kidnapped, thrown into a hotel room and sold. Fraud, we had one girl who thought she was answering an ad to a modeling agency, smart girl, graduated from high school in three years. And when she got there, this huge man forced her in a car and sold her out of a hotel into, until our law enforcement um, officer able, was able to get her. Um, so that's fraud. She thought she was signing up for something and forced into it. And then the coercion is like I explained before, where they're slowly over time kind of brainwashed and worn down into this life. And our law protects them and says that they can be coerced into this. And so that protects them. And it also states that if a person is 18 years or younger and in the commercial sex industry that stripping pornography forced prostitution that they are a human trafficking victim so there's no such thing as a child prostitute and so the laws protect them and so that's really important to um, continue to support that the um, reauthorization of that law and then there's um, other protections that give compensation back and there's laws that are we just you know just passed the law that is um, able to shut down um, agencies like, you know, Backpage.com is the number one place where these victims, I mean, I think 99% of our young people were advertised on Backpage.com's escort services. So now that's been shut down by a law and that now they can sue civilly to, um, you know, recover some of their dignity because of that. So there's constantly things that are coming up against Congress that those are some of the things I can think of just right off the right off hand. So if we start some, realizing something that might be a telltale sign, is there something that we can do or how we should take that approach um, if we were going up towards a victim or how would, how would you even recommend handling something along those lines? You know, we tell our people not to approach a victim or a trafficker, but to report it to law enforcement. And law enforcement are more and more trained um, to recognize 
sex trafficking. And so the, what's important is if you go in a hotel room, and this, is, this happened last week, and so, actually someone working at a hotel noticed two young girls and thought those girls are being trafficked out of that room. And so they called us, we called law enforcement, and they went over there, um, and they were able to retrieve those two young girls. We've had someone call us and say that they saw, you know, an expensive Lexus um, where, you know, one nationality driving it and a young girl, the different nationality got out, met an older man in the hotel and went up the escal- or elevator and they called on that. And so law enforcement was able to go and intervene. So when you see things and you're like, something's not right, you know, what is going on there? You know, it's, I mean, we've had girls repeatedly tell us that they're sold out of, in front of Walmart. And they're pimps there, you know. And so I think when you just have that gut feeling where you're like, why is that young person with that older person that doesn't look right? You know, call law enforcement and say, I suspect, you know, human trafficking. And we had one girl go to one of our trainings and she called one of our law enforcement agencies and she said, I'm watching this um, uh, limousine and a bunch of girls get out of it and it looks like human trafficking to me. And our law enforcement guy was like ah this can't be anything and she goes well here's the driver's license and he ran it went and found them and sure enough recovered several victims and so we've had um people uh, one um saw a girl being pulled into a big rig truck at the truck stop and didn't think it looked right called law enforcement and they went over and got it and it was a young girl and they the actually the assistant chief called me and said this girl won't tell us her name she won't tell us where she's from but i know she's a trafficking victim but we can't get anything will you come talk to her and we can go in because we can say i'm from unbound i work with an organization that fights human trafficking let me explain to you what that is and i can say i'm not law enforcement i'm not a probation officer and they can trust us and we can bridge that with law enforcement and so when i explained it to the girl she her eyes got big and she said i told my mom i told my grandma that was what was happening they didn't believe me and this girl had been um, on the missing exploited um, children list out of uh, Dallas and had been um, being sold and so they were able to recover her Um, and so that was those were community members that are learning they're educating themselves they're coming to some of our trainings or and um, and then they're able to recognize it and just call and say this doesn't look right and law enforcement is checking it out and we're recovering victims and so what can we do as a community to, pr- to promote awareness? I think have agencies like Unbound, um, some of your child advocacy groups are doing trainings, law enforcement's doing more in trainings on human trafficking. I think asking law enforcement, what are you doing? Asking your DA, hey, are we, are we prioritizing this? Are we you know, looking for victims? Are we prosecuting um, buyers? Are, because, you know, buyers, if you look across the nation, there's a big push a John suppression um, sting, and you may have seen that, but where law enforcement agencies across the nation are arresting buyers and holding them accountable, putting their picture in the newspaper because it's communicating as a community, hey, this is behavior we will not tolerate, the buying and selling of people. And it is human trafficking. These girls are made and sold, you know, 10, 20 times out of a hotel room, losing their education, their relationships, their Spirit. I mean, it's just, it's horrific. And we need to hold the buyers accountable because it's a supply and demand business. And if there was not the demand for it, then our young people wouldn't be the supply chain for it. And so um, asking law enforcement, are we combating human trafficking? Are you doing stings and arresting buyers? DA's office, are we holding buyers accountable? What's our protocol for human trafficking victims? And um, really as a community saying, hey, this is something we care about. You know, schools, are we educating kids on social media safety and the harms of um, human trafficking so that we can protect them because education is power. And when the students, they can become advocates instead of victims when they're educated. So those are some ways that the community can really really put pressure on um, other agencies to say, hey, and that's what I tell our community. At first, they're like, oh, we don't want people to know that this is happening. I'm like, it's happening everywhere, you know? And then we started doing all these arrests, and they're like, oh, you know, we have it more than other people. I'm like, no, we're just addressing it. And I'm like, we are, this is something our city can be proud about, that we are on the front end of protecting our community and our most vulnerable people. And so um, that's, that's something that we should all fight for. 
And I really do think that that's one of those issues that we run into that people don't want to talk about certain subject matters because they're, they're ashamed or afraid to reference something along these lines. So I really appreciate you and the Unbound organization actually going out there and being the forefront runners and saying, Hey, we need to pay attention to this. These are things that are actually happening because I'll tell you before we started talking, my, my, I did, I wasn't aware on how this was occurring in the U S I kept on thinking that, Hey, it's, it's third world countries that this is occurring with. So it is in doing some of the research research and having the conversation with you. I've just been amazed on why do we try to push these things off to the back and not really do it for the forefront and really make people understand this is what's taking place. And these are the conversations that we need to start having with our family members, our children, our communities and saying, this is something we really need to focus on. It's absolutely something we have to focus on because especially because everyone has a smartphone and they have the apps and parents don't realize how dangerous this is how these perpetrators are going after our kids. So when your kids have their phones alone in their rooms, they're talking to strangers or if a boy is gaming, you know, I've had lots of friends that even know about this walk in and their son is innocently playing a game, but they realize he is in dialogue and communicating with this older man who is being befriending my son. And that, that is not a healthy situation that you would normally allow. So why are we allowing it on social media? Because that is how these perpetrators are going after our children. They're building a trust and a relationship. And then they're saying, hey, come meet me. And then introducing this really horrible um, life to them. And so it's super important that we educate them on it and that we monitor it because they're too young to really realize what they're doing and we have to protect them. And so it, it's important. And when what happened when we started, I would bring cases. I would look up and say, these young people are being advertised in our community for sex and take it to law enforcement. And they were like, no way, this isn't happening here. And then when we started giving them real cases, they're like, oh my goodness, these are real cases here. And then the schools, we kept saying we need to educate in the schools and they weren't very open to it at first. But then when they started, every school district around here has had a human trafficking case. And they're like, now we are doing assemblies in schools that haven't done assemblies in five years because they see how important it is to protect the kids because of the social media and the way they befriend people so, so easily. And it's too vulnerable for them and they need to protect them. So when it comes to the whole social media aspect, what do you recommend? Do you recommend supervising your children as they're actually on social media? Do you recommend, is there an app that could be recommended or do these people hide so well inside of social media? I know that you referenced earlier about them playing or pretending to be a younger age than what they actually are. And then when they come and meet them, I mean, what can one do? I think the biggest thing is for some reason, parents don't feel like, they feel like it's too invasive to be looking at their kids' phones and text messages and apps. And I, and I just think it's, it's too dangerous of a day. We have to. And kids want to be protected even though they push back. So I think especially young kids, I think when you're introducing the phone saying, hey, our family policy, I'm paying for your phone. You know, I'm going to monitor it and make sure that you're safe. And so I think, you know, having that open policy, knowing what the passcodes are, knowing what their social media site is, and just looking at them and checking them. And as a partner with your kids, sitting down with them saying, you know, hey, what's you know, let's just go through your phone together. I just want to make sure you're safe and no one's reaching out to you um, that we wouldn't want. And just being partners with them in that, I think, is really, really, really smart. And I know that parents are hesitant to do that, but I would advise doing that because um, it's just too dangerous. And young girls, you know, even if it's not sex trafficking, the sexting has become so prevalent. And so helping kids navigate that world and that pressure, I think is really important because it can be used to manipulate that child into even further um, harm. And so I think it's, I think parents have to choose a different posture when it comes to monitoring social media to keep their kids safe. And I agree, I agree with you because this is one, it's just one of these things that when you start hearing more and more about it, it's what can I do? How can we do it? So I really do appreciate everything that you and Unbound does. And for more information, please go to unboundnow.org. Or if not, you can come to our website at Safety FM and we'll put a cross link to go over to it. I do appreciate your time today. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. 
Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen. Safety FM, changing safety cultures, one broadcast and one podcast at a time.